So repeat after me. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Homage to the blessed, noble, and perfectly enlightened one. Namo sadanto suche doye olahadi samyao samputo jye. Wu Sang San San Wei Miao Fa Bai Chen Wan Jie Nan Zao Yu Wu Jing Jen Wen De So Chu Yuan Jie Ru Lai Zen Shi Yi The unsurpassed, deep, profound, subtle, wonderful Dharma and a hundred thousand million eons is difficult to encounter. Now that I've come to receive and hold it within my sight and hearing, I vow to fathom the thus come one's true and actual meaning. Good evening, everyone. All Dharma Dharma Master, Dharma Masters, and good friends. Tonight uh, is October 11th, and we're about to start our sutra lecture tonight. And what we do is, let me move these books. As we begin by reciting the title of the sutra, which is in front of you, it says, uh, the homage to the Buddha's flower garland sutra of great expanded teachings and the ocean wine flower garland assembly of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. So below is the Chinese. Um, and so what we do is we start chanting, start the sutra by chanting the Chinese uh, Chinese characters. And this is a way to you can say, invoke the presence of the Avatamsaka, or the flower garland assemblies of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. So if you could please join join me. Open the text to page 10 and 11. Page 10 and 11. We're on the... We're on the second paragraph. 
of page 10 into Chinese and the second paragraph on page 11 for the English. So for people who are new here tonight, what we do is we first recite the Chinese together and then we read the English. Um, or we say, I read a line of Chinese and people repeat after that and then we read the English together. So that gets the, so you can say the sound of the, the, the sutra text in our mind, in our hearts. Um, there's a, definitely a feeling when we recite holy text that there's something that connects inside. So when we recite the text, there's definitely something that connects inside. So if you could put your palms together, we'll start on page 10 with the two characters that has an F-O and a Z-I. So you can, if you have, don't have any Chinese background, you can practice your Chinese. Okay. 佛子, 慈菩萨摩诃萨慈菩萨摩诃萨辅作事念与第一地不了故名无名所作业果是行 行一子初心事实事事与是共生事取运与是共生事取运为名色为名色名色增长名色增长为六处为六处根净事 三世和和事处，三世和和事处，处共生有受，处共生有受，与受染作是爱，与受染作是爱，爱增长是取，爱增长是取，执着其有漏业未有。从业起运卫生，从业起运卫生，运守为牢，运守为牢，运坏为死，运坏为死。So finish the page. 死时离别，死时离别，愚迷贪恋，愚迷贪恋，心胸烦闷未愁。替死之皆为叹在五根未苦在一滴未有忧苦转堕未挠忧苦转堕未挠汝是丹有苦素增长 Okay, so if we go to page 11, you can recite together. Disciples of the Buddha, this Bodhisattva Mahasattva further makes the following reflection. Ignorance is the failure to understand the truth in the primary sense. Activities is what we call karma that we create and its retribution. Consciousness is what we call the first thought on which activities rely and stop. Name and form is the name we give the four grasping skandhas that are born along with consciousness. Name and form increase and become the six places. There are three aspects which are sense organs, states, and consciousnesses combine and become what we call contact. Contact happens along with feelings. Love happens when feelings are colored by attachments. Love increases and creates grasping. Existence comes about when karma with outflows arises from grasping. Birth comes about when the skandhas arise from karma. Old age happens when the skandhas mature. Death then is the destruction of the skandhas. Par parting happens at the time of death. In our confusion, we feel greed and longing. This leads to troubling and misery. 
melancholy and grief. Tears flow followed by wails and lamentation. The five sense organs know suffering. On the ground of the mind, this becomes worry. As worry and suffering increase, they turn into afflictions. In that way, a tree of suffering grows and increases. But in this process, there is no self nor anything that belongs to self. There is no doer of deeds, neither is there a receiver of actions. Okay, so for those who are here for the first time or are new to the sutra text, we are in the sutra called the Avatamsaka Sutra, called also translated the Flower Garden Sutra. And you could say it's the, when I say the word sutra, it's the words of the Buddha. And this particular sutra is considered one of the, the, the broadest, the most encompassing sutras in the Buddhist teachings. So in this one, he really outlines the entire cultivate, the path of awakening for how one becomes a Buddha. So this text is actually part of a very large collection of text. And we're just at the, um, about halfway through all the sutra text. And particularly in this section, we're on the sixth ground. So we're a little bit past halfway point for this Bodhisattva because there's 10 grounds in all in this particular section. So he's on the sixth ground. And if people who might have a little bit of Buddhist background, it, the 10 grounds corresponds to the paramitas. So people know the paramitas. The first one is that of generosity, of giving. The second is that of uh, ethical life, that of shila or precepts. A third is cultivating patience, a move, mind that's not moving. A fourth is uh, vigor, working really hard. The fifth is developing a concentrated mind, a focused mind, a still mind. And now we're on the sixth paramita, which is the paramita of prajna wisdom. Prajna is the Sanskrit word for wisdom. And um, this bodhisattva at this point in the sutra text is actually describing one of, you could say, the foremost teachings that the Buddha discovered uh, about the nature of reality. And the Buddha is actually, the bodhisattva here is actually contemplating this particular, you could say, a causal chain of events that create our reality. So what we're here is actually a very, very, you could say, profound teaching that if we really applied it and observed it, we would actually wake up. We would actually wake up. And so it's often titled called the 12 links of conditioned arising or dependent origination. It's shared in pretty much all Buddhist traditions. This is one of the, you could say, the backbones of our, of our, of our tradition. And if you are familiar with the text already, what I would definitely encourage people doing is actually see if you can memorize it in your mind. Because this is actually a very useful list for, for you to have in your memory. And sometimes when you're meditating, you know, something comes up and this also comes up in your memory and your something connects and you, you kind of make sense of a little bit of this particular teaching. Because the teachings of the Buddha are there for reflection. They're not, uh, a, you could say, a doctrine to believe in. They're not uh, something you just put on a, a pedestal and you just pay respect to and don't, don't really go and understand. The Buddha's teaching is definitely something you want to look at and see if this makes sense in your own life. And so this particular one, I would say, is a very, very useful list for understanding how this world works, um, how this world works. I know many uh, people... Um, just recently, a young man came and, and spoke, spent some time with me. Um, I don't know how many people are maybe under 35, under 35, under 35, yeah, under 35. I think there's a, a fairly, I don't know if this is true, and people can kind of reflect in your own process, working with young people, or if you're a young person yourself. Um, I'm under 35, and I can attest to it in my own process, is that growing up in this modern times, we actually are presented many, many different ways of seeing the world. Um, there's no longer one way that is the right way to see the world. In, in, in pretty much for granted in my generation. We're, we're in a generation where uh, pretty much everyone's expected to have their own way of seeing the world, and you give everybody the space to be in their space, in their world. 
if you were to go and apply your own values on them, they'll be feeling like you're taking up their space and they'd be very upset, which is I think why a lot of parents and kids in this generation, we actually have a lot of uh, difficulties is because uh, parents have a different, my, at least my, my, myself, my parents have a different experience of what the world is as a younger generation, than the younger generation growing up. I came over with immigrant parents coming from Taiwan. And so, you know, they have a, a different exp understanding of the world. They have actually um, more or less one way of seeing things. That's how they understood the world and how they see things through. And it makes sense. And, and things, you know, work through that, that lens. But growing up, um, I think getting American values as well, as well as some Asian values that I find that I had to figure it out myself. And so this young man came and spoke with me. He was also an Asian American. And he, was, he made an interesting comment. He says, you know, I don't know really what, tr what thoughts I can trust in my own mind. You know, I can't, I don't know if I can trust my own mind. Like what am I really, what thought is, thoughts I can follow and what thoughts can I not follow? What makes sense? What are the ways that I can make sense of this world that's in front of me? You know, do I take a, a capitalist view on the world? Do I take an you know, artistic view of the world? Do I take an Asian, more uh, family-based view of the world? Do I just go and try to be successful in an individualistic way in a, kind of a West American do-it-yourself mentality and uh, kind of rebel a little bit from my parents and do my own thing? You know, what, what do I trust in my mind? How do I make any of my decisions that I'm going to make? And he was particularly... Um, basically considering his next step in life. He's finished college and he wants to go, you know, find a job. And he's not sure, what should I do next? You know, what's, what's next? And so, um, for many of us, uh, maybe we're not quite there. You know, we've already settled on a job. Or maybe we're raising a family. Or, or maybe we are. Maybe we are thinking, really, what's this life about? What really can I trust in my own mind? How can I find something that I can rely on? And if you are, have those thoughts in your mind, I'll say, you don't have to look too far because it's right in front of you. <laughs> this is something you can actually rely on and is actually, uh, you could say, the inner workings of our existence. And it seems very, uh, you could say, dry. It's not, it's not spoken in kind of a mystical language. It's not spoken in a kind of uh, magical uh, romantic, you know, idealized words. It's just like this happens, then this happens, then this happens, then this happens. This happens, it's like physics, or, or it's like, you know, you do engineering, you learn, okay, this happened, like computers, you got, you know, this program, you do this, da da da, and then this thing comes out, and the next thing happens, and next, it's like, tick, 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 tick. so this is, this is what that is. This is basically just telling you how it is. It's not trying to make it fancy at all. And so, to really understand it, though, takes quite a bit of unpacking because it's describing uh, the nature of how things work, how our mind works, how our lives work, how in Buddhism as well, this is also a list that describes how the process of rebirth works, how we go from life to life. So it's not just this moment, our existence, but also how this existence continues on into the future. That's a very, very important uh, teaching. Um, so before I, I kind of explain it, the other thing I wanted to point out is that the very, to point out the very end of it, because um, there's, a, there's a saying of the Buddha, he says, my, the, my teachings have one flavor, and that's the flavor of liberation, that of freedom, and it's the freedom from suffering. That's, that's the point of the Buddha's teachings. The Buddha is basically trying to see, oh, you're sick? You have that problem? Okay, here's what you do. Here's the antidote for your problem. So here, at the very end of the list, you see he says, uh, basically, he gives it quite, quite uh, drastically. You know, We die. We uh, have this longing. We have this sense of trouble and worry and misery, melancholy, grief. And then there's wails and lamentation. And the suffering increases. And so you get the sense that's, that's the nature of what can happen to us when we start our minds off in the wrong way. 
but Buddhism is trying to teach it. The Buddha is trying to teach how can you start this process in a better way so that we don't get stuck in that situation. That's that's the point of this teaching. It's not to uh, to outline something saying that oh our life is miserable, but saying this is what happens. This is the mechanism whereby confusion, uh, suffering arises. And so what I would like to teach you is how to get free of it. How to get free of it. And so, so, um, so with that, we can look at the first, first line. It says, Disciples of the Buddha, this Bodhisattva Mahasattva further makes the following reflection. So what, just to give some more context, the speaker of this sutra text right now is actually a bodhisattva named Vajra Treasury Bodhisattva. And he's saying, a bodhisattva who's at this level of cultivation, the sixth ground. You know, if, if we were to think of becoming a bodhisattva as like 10 grades of school, he's in sixth grade, you know, he's in middle school. And he's about to, uh, you know, he's learning this dharma. And so this bodhisattva at this level, say basically making a reflection saying, ignorance is the name we give failure to understand truth in the primary sense. So uh, that line probably could be the whole lecture if we really wanted to dwell on it. Your question? Want a bodhisattva? Okay. Um, if you want to, I think, put in the most plain language that we can understand, it would be a being who's dedicated his life to benefiting other beings and by doing that through awakening himself and ultimately awakening others and um, an awakening is basically helping people see through their suffering so they're completely free of it that's the that's the bodhisattva path so he makes a resolve not to just do it himself but to do it for all beings so um, it's it's in in our tradition in in, in this t this monastery, that's the ideal. So we, you can say, follow the spiritual path, not just so that I can find liberation or freedom from suffering, but rather I wish that by doing so, I can be of benefit to the world ultimately. I can help all living beings. So usually the the the, uh, the standard definition is a bodhisattva is a per a being who awakens himself or him herself or awakens and awakens others. And the Buddha is somebody who's actually perfected his awakening. So the Buddha Bodhisattva is on the path to becoming a Buddha, a completely awakened being. So that's a Bodhisattva. And the second second one, it says Mahasattva. Maha in Sanskrit means great, and Sattva means being. So it means literally great being. Um, if we want to use the same breakdown for the Bodhisattva, Bodhi means awakening, and Sattva means being. So it's awakened being so that's the that's the uh, that's the breakdown of the word so to this particular principle um, I won't dwell on it too much because I think I wanted to get to where I think we really can apply our our energy if we really want to begin to free ourselves from our suffering um, because to work in this particular place which is failure to understand truth in the primary sense really requires a, quite a lot of, you could say, stillness in the mind and uh, a kind of goodness and awakening in the heart. You can say it's always accessible to us. We can always get back to that place of the, prime, the truth in the primary sense. But um, for many of us, given our minds, it's hard to just immediately go there, for at least for myself, to, to go to that place. So... I'll just point to it and just give people a sense of what that is. Um, I actually brought two texts here because I think this is probably where um, you'll probably get one of the most accessible, uh, accessible, you could say, uh, teachings on the prime sutra, the the truth in the primary sense is actually the Six Patriarch Sutra. The Six Patriarch is a Zen master or Chan master in China, who is. Uh, was actually seen as one of the pretty much the main teacher who made uh, the Chan or the Zen tradition um, prosper in China and later went to Japan and he's held with great esteem and so here's another this is the book with our our, our founders here Venerable Master Shen Hua's commentary so Venerable Master Shen Hua made a commentary on this text and this is the other other text 
So if you're interested, we have these books available, probably, you can ask. And um, it's a very, very good explanation on what it means to have the truth in the primary sense. And it does it because it does it through a story of this uh, Chan master and his process of meeting a teacher and cultivating the path. And for me, what's the most inspiring is actually seeing how he lived his life. Um, just to give a couple highlights. Uh, in, in China, uh, so his, his, he was actually born into a very uh, poor family. His father was exiled from the government, maybe for uh, being, uh, not for sure, the sutra doesn't really say exactly for what, but possibly because maybe his, his father was maybe too honest or something and didn't, didn't play along with the politics of the time, so he got exiled. And so he lived a very uh, difficult life because his father also passed away. So he was a woodcutter, and he would cut wood, and he really didn't get an education, and he took care of his mother. But one day he heard a verse from a sutra, and the sutra verse was uh, uh, basically produced, okay, I don't know what the new translation is, but produced a thought that's nowhere attached. Basically, do not attach to anything, you could say. Do not have, do not attach to anything in your mind. And he heard that, that, that verse, and he immediately had a kind of an awakening. He said, where is that from? Who's teaching about that? And so he found out there's another uh, Zen master, a Chan master, teaching about this teachings. So he went there to learn from this master. And so this story goes on and on. And in this monastery, there's a lot of, uh, you could say, uh, competition. People were, were fairly competitive. People were not their mind, they're more, more just working on the external form, meaning they're trying to give off the appearance of like their practitioners, but not really working on their mind. And so the fifth patriarch at the time um, basically made a contest. He made a contest saying, okay, uh, I want to pass on the robe and bowl. So monastics, we have a robe, right? our three robes, and we have a bowl, which is our alms bowl. And this robe and bowl was passed on from Bodhidharma, who was seen as the first patriarch, the person who brought the Zen teachings to China. And these became almost like symbols of power, kind of like the Holy Grail, in a, if we had a kind of the Christian analogy maybe. It's like the Holy Grail. And so everybody's looking to those objects with, with quite a lot of greed. And so the fifth picture says, I'm going to pass on the robe and bowl but the person has to write an enlightened verse, a verse that shows their awakening. And so everybody in the monastery actually thought, you know, we have a senior teacher. His name is uh, Venerable Sun Xiu. And since he's our teacher, he's obviously going to get the robe and bowl. So we don't have to worry about writing anything. He's going to get it, no problem. <laughs> now, Venerable Sun Xiu, however, was uh, unfortunately not awakened. So he was really worried, stressed out. Uh, so much so that what he actually ended up doing was he said, okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to write my verse on the wall at midnight. Because what I'll do is if the teacher sees it and says it's a good verse, then I will fess up to it and I'll say, I wrote this verse. But if it's a bad verse, then I won't say anything. Okay, so he kind of just calculating in his mind. You know, okay, so this is what I'm going to do. This is definitely not the awakened mind. It's the... The, the mind of duality and self and other and, and wanting to be success, successful. And so he wrote this verse, and what he wrote was basically, um, let's see, the body is like a Bodhi tree, the mind a mirror stand bright. Time again and again, wipe it clean. Let no dust alight. So basically, he wrote this verse. Um, people who know a little bit about Buddhism know is saying that basically we use our bodies to cultivate the way. Our mind's like a mirror. And what we want to do is prevent the dust from getting the mirror dirty. So we just continually clean it. We clean the mirror all the time. So that's one way of seeing Buddhist practice, is we see our, our confusion and we 
we clean it. We, we get rid of the confusion bit by bit, bit by bit, bit by bit. Right? So, so that's what he wrote. So then it so happened that the sixth patriarch heard this verse one day and uh, said, wait, I have a verse too. So he gave a verse. And his verse, okay, actually, I'll just go back a step. So the, the, the teacher came out, the fifth patriarch came out, saw the verse and said, oh, it's a very good verse. So who wrote it? And so the Venerable Sensual came out and said, I wrote it. <laughs> okay, and then the fifth part, okay, it's a very good verse. Everybody, please bow to this verse. If you recite this and practice by it, you will not uh, go, to bad, go into the bad paths. You will, be, you will live a generally happy life. But he said, this, this verse wasn't really an awakened verse. He said, but you will live a happy life. It's a good verse. Cultivate by it. And, and so, so later, this verse was being recited in the monastery, and the sixth patriarch heard this verse. And so he thought immediately, he knew immediately that wasn't a verse that was an awakening. So he, he said to this person, he went to the verse and said, you know, I have a verse to give as well. And he was seen as an illiterate, actually seen as a kind of a barbarian. And people would look, really look down upon him. And they were surprised, you have a verse too? He says, yeah, I have a verse. So he wrote a verse and he said, basically, um, B Bodhi, basically Bodhi has no tree. So Bodhi's awakening, like I said, Bodhisattva. Bodhi has no tree. Neither is there a mirror stand bright. Originally, there is not one thing. Where can dust alight? So that's, you could say the truth in the primary sense. Originally, there is no duality whatsoever. So where could affliction even land on? So that's in some ways beyond our state. <laughs> it's beyond what we're, what we, uh, you could say, um, have in our moment-to-moment -moment consciousness. We don't really, we're not really awakened to that realization. So we kind of get lost in our mind. But that's the ultimate. And I think to know that that's true is really helpful because in Buddhism it says that's what we're heir to. That's fundamentally our nature is this bright, complete wisdom that's humble, respectful, completely unfettered and unobstructed. And so you, you watch the Sixth Patriarch's life. People make fun of him. People are out to kill him. Um, he's completely unfazed in every single situation. In fact, he ends up teaching the people who are out to kill him. <laughs> they, he's very respectful to them still, and, and he changes them for the better. And he teaches them you know, the Dharma. So he's, his life is very much an exemplar of what it means to be in this state um, of being, oh, knowing what the truth is in the primary sense. So for me, although I, can't, I don't know the state, for me it's very inspiring to see, you know, for instance, somebody's life who's living that life and knowing that it's not like you realize the emptiness of Buddhism and somehow your life is like dead. He actually cautions that a lot, that basically meditation is not trying to, to get into an empty state of mind where your mind is just basically kind of lifeless and you don't know what's going on. It's actually a completely responsive, um, clear, uh, awake mind. That's the idea. And so the Bodhisattva here, when he's going through these teachings on prajna, it can seem a little bit uh, cold. It can seem a little bit um, kind of like hard to really get uh, something to, to relate to emotionally to, you can say. But the reason for that is because it's really going into the mind almost like a doctor and just cleaning stuff up, clearing stuff up. And what it's trying to get us back to is what uh, I would say the sixth patriarch embodies with his life. He embodies a, a life that's, um, that's basically following the truth in the primary sense. Okay, so that's the first one. Um, the second one is that called activities. And this is what uh, the sutra says, activities is what we call karma and we create, that we create and its retribution. So from this ignorance, by not recognizing the truth in the primary sense, we start doing things. So when the Buddhism talks about activities, it's actually a very subtle layer. Uh, it's something, it's not um, basically just things we do outside with our bodies and our, and our mouth. It's actually this kind of very subtle uh, 
patterns of consciousness, uh, patterns of things that are going on that actually form our consciousness. So that you can see the next step is actually consciousness. So this is actually very, very subtle. That before even consciousness happens, we actually create these activities which then form the basis of our consciousness. So as I, it's hard for us to really penetrate. If you spend some time meditating, you know, spend, go to a meditation retreat, you can begin to enter the mind in this way. In fact, this particular teaching is said to be what uh, uh, a particular type of enlightened being wakes up to. We call them Pracheka Buddhas or solitary enlightened ones. Um, they're ones who go out into nature and observe the natural process of the world. So they may never meet the Buddha's teachings, but by watching the natural flows of nature, they actually observe this process happening from, the, from seeing you know, life come to, come to being, life dying, all the various processes, the process in their own minds, they wake up to this. So as Buddhism says, this is not Buddhism you know, copyrighted. It's not like the Buddha owns this. Basically, this is part of our fundamental nature. So there's beings who, by going on to nature, are able to not be amidst so many distractions and reflect into their minds and see this. So this is where it is at. So they have to go down through consciousness to activities. So activities are these basic patterns of, of activities that give rise to consciousness. So then the next one is consciousness. And the sutra says, consciousness is what we call the first thought in which activities rely and stop. And so consciousness is what I would say we're aware of. We, use, we have this kind of awareness that we can uh, be aware of things. So then we have consciousness. So that's something I think we can actually uh, immediately reference. We're usually not paying that much attention to it. We're usually paying attention to what's outside. But behind that, there's actually a conscious awareness that's aware of things that are going on. So, so there's this consciousness that is basically out there and um, being aware of all these objects and discriminating them, this, 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 this. So that's consciousness. The next one in this process is called name and form. So says name and form is the name we give the four grasping skandhas that are born along with consciousness. So, um, uh, I don't want to get people too overwhelmed by terminology. Um, for the four skandhas, usually there's five skandhas in Buddhism. The first one is called uh, the body, form, is, is, is the first skandha. The second one is uh, feeling. The third is cognition. The fourth is activities, or kind of what we're talking about, the kind of underlying patterns of existence. The fifth is consciousness. So that's why it says the four other grasping skandhas is because in addition to consciousness, we have these other four skandhas. So what particularly this is referring to, you don't have to worry so much about terminology, is that name and form is referring to everything that we're seeing in the material world as well as the label we're putting onto it. So it's basically from consciousness, we then create language, we then create this entire external reality, everything comes out, right? So this is, as I said, this is kind of like scientific and, and pretty, uh, you know, step by step. Okay, so you have ignorance from missing, missing the primary truth. Okay, then you have activities, which then form your consciousness, which then form your entire reality and the symbols you use to understand reality. And then from there, it says, you create the six places and these three aspects, which are the six, the six sense organs, the states and consciousness combined, and that becomes contact. So the six places really refer to the six sense organs. Okay, sorry for the technicality, but six sense organs, which is our eyes, ears, nose, bo tongue, body, and the sixth sense in Buddhism, not a mystical sixth sense, it's the mind. So it sees our mind as another sense that we use. And what the mind does is that it perceives thoughts. Okay, so you have the five senses, eyes see sights, ears hear sounds, nose smells, odors, uh, tongue tastes flavors, the body feels sensation, and the mind perceives thoughts. So it's the six senses, sense organs, 
the six states, which are the six uh, sense objects, we call them, the sense objects that come into contact with our, our, uh, our six sense organs, and then consciousness, which, which, is which, which is what is there to discriminate and to parse it up, to make sense of it. You know, so it's our eyes take in uh, sights, and then we process it through some process that you could say is maybe neurological through the brain, but it's kind of not for sure exactly how it all works, but somehow it goes into our consciousness and we're aware, oh, that's, you know, that's a camera in front of me. That's an image of a Gwani Bodhisattva in front of me. There's an audience here. Somehow we process the information. So this is the process called um, the six sense organs or six places. And that is what I just described, creates contact. Contact meaning sensory imprint, sensory data. So you see something. Okay? So it's, this is very, very technical. right? You can see how this can break down your experience. Going. Okay. So then you have contact. And then after contact, we have something called feelings. Uh, so now we're actually getting closer to where this is really applicable to our life. So feelings comes out, and that's where we have feelings of like, dislike, or neutrality, or kind of, we say, um, neutral, no, no like, dislike. And so, you know, for instance, we see somebody. And so somebody we like, it, we, we are attracted to, and then we go, oh, I like him, or I like her. You know, something we dislike, we kind of want to stay away. We kind of have a, and, or if it's neutral, it's like a stranger, we just kind of pass right by. We don't, we don't even notice. And so we do that with pretty much everything we come in contact with. That's the next step, is that we apply all our previous habitual ways of seeing things to this moment of contact, which then forms a like or dislike. So there's a very important principle here, which is that to this point, it's actually karmic. Your past karma has basically brought you to this point of when you experience some data coming in. You really don't have too much control of that. So in Buddhism, we say don't apply your energy there because when you see something, all your previous stuff comes up and you immediately like or dislike. So you don't want to try to change this like or dislike because it's not easy. You have to actually go back to this uh, failure to understand truth in the primary sense, your kind of basic samskaric processes, your um, activity processes. So rather, um, what Buddhism says is that where you have the most freedom is between the t these two links called feeling and love, or you could say desire, thirsting. So when we come into contact with something and we like or dislike it, or this neutral sense, what we, what we do with our mind next is that we then want it, or, then, or we hate it, or we don't have any desire whatsoever, just kind of, okay, neutral. So that's where Buddhism says you have probably the most control over if you want to free yourself from suffering for us in this first phase. So you really want to apply your energy there. Um, if you were to look at it, I think it's, it's something we can probably identify in our own experience. If you uh, just watch, if you have a little bit of stillness, you know, if you meditate a little bit in your day, starting the day off, and then you just watch your mind go to something, and you'll see your senses hit an object, and then all of a sudden you have this, a dr you're drawn towards it, if you like or dislike it, and then you have this sense of wanting it. So that's, that's that process. And so in our meditation, in terms of mindfulness practice in Buddhism, you really want to get uh, familiar with that process, because that's where the most freedom uh, you can gain from your own, uh, you could say, uh, enslavement to this process. This process is basically this kind of mechanism that traps us. So Buddhism is actually very, very, uh, gives us a lot of choice, but most of the time we don't really know we have that choice. We're just going through this mechanism. You know, I would say marketing. I mean, I think modern times we have, you know, marketing and all these advertising and these, these things going in modern times. They're using this mechanism to catch people's minds. You know, they analyze what people's likes and dislikes are. What's their categories they're using to understand reality, name and form, right? Then they go and figure out how they come into contact with these objects of desire, how because of their categories they'll like it or dislike it, and then how they will 
incite desire to draw somebody into their into the world. Okay, so if we don't watch our minds, we just get trapped by, you know, the advertisers or whatever people are trying to trap us or manipulate us into their world. So if we want to actually get free, we actually have to watch our mind. And this is the place we can get free. Even if it's not from outside, it's, <laughs> we do it to ourselves. So we, want to, we don't want to be trapped by our own, uh, own confusion. So that's, that's what I'll say is that the, this, this particular one is where love occurs. Where um, love is a difficult translation because love often has positive connotations in English. Um, it's this love is a kind of an emotional attached love that you go out thinking that from something outside you will find a solution for your life. You know, you want something. You're you're fundamentally not complete. You're lacking something, and then you need to go out to get something. So that's. That's the key piece. So I don't know, if, do people see that? Can people kind of identify with that? I know it's fairly, uh, fairly detailed. So I know I might have left people kind of going, wow, this is a lot of information. Could you say again where you can make the most progress? progress? The spirit between the contact, and here the translation is love, but you could say um, the craving is another translation they give. Or I would say also hate, craving or hate. It's, it's both, both, both reactions. So when we come into contact with something, like we see, we see these flowers, and we might think, wow, beautiful. We like it. Now, there can be a thought next. Wow, I want it. You know, and you want to grab it, or you want to take it, or you want to do something. There's a, there's a kind of something, if your mind is greedy, I mean, I think people probably can see it most with, in modern times, something like money, or technology, I think people, you know, see somebody maybe some you see a hundred dollar bill on the sidewalk, and your mind goes, "Ooh, I want it." You know, <laughs> what happened? Well, how did your mind go so quick? You know, the flowers doesn't go so quick, but you see something else, it's like you know something happens in the mind. So, how do you catch your mind from doing that so you don't get lost? You know, you don't end up doing the next action, which might be actually to, to grab it, which is here. The next one here is you grasp it. You know. You basically grab the object or you grab it in your own mind. And from there, you create an identity. That's what existence here is about. So it says, you have grasping. Existence comes about when karma with outflows arises from grasping. Okay, that's fairly technical language. But if I were just to make it a little bit simpler, it would be you create an identity around it. Um, probably where I can identify that the most harmful and clearest is where when parents identify that their life is their kids and try to live their identity through their kids. You know, and the kids feel this kind of pressure that I have to live my parents' dreams in a certain way. And then the kid doesn't live that dream for the parents, the parents get really upset. Right? So you can see when you identify with something, you can you you can create a lot of suffering. So it doesn't mean that you are completely uh, would you say don't care about anything in the world. It's that you're you're not attached to anything in the world. You ha still have this compassion and this care for living beings that's very, very deep, but it's not coming from a conditioned place. It's not coming from a place, because you're my friend, I care about you. It's because you're my sister or brother or my mother or my father or my son or my daughter, then I care about you. It's coming from a much deeper place. In some ways you can say, we became monastics largely because we're trying to cultivate a different type of, of you could say, kindness or loving kindness not an emotional kind that's based on relationships um, so from there from existence from identifying we give rise to birth so birth comes about when the skandhas arise from karma so basically uh, we're born you know something comes into existence we have this identity we're born and then from that process old age we get old and then we get sick and then we die so that's the process. So if you look at this particular process, we actually age every time we attach to something. So there are certain people you see who are older and still kind of very young at heart and kind of vibrant and, and kind of flexible and alive and happy in this process. And you sometimes see people who are kind of really brittle and unhappy and kind of, kind of you know, rigid and, you know. If you were to say old age doesn't just come from it doesn't actually really come from aging in a way. It comes from the mind attaching to things and forming identity around it 
and kind of not being able to let go of it. So that's really where aging comes from, is if your mind starts attaching to things and saying, it has to be this way, it has to be this way, it has to be this way, and all the kind of stresses of the life cart accumulating in your body and your mind and your face and your, yeah, it's just very uncomfortable. So it says old age comes and then death comes, you know, because what happens is, well, because you attach to it, what happens is that thing you attach to won't always be like that, you know, if you really, you know, like, you know, this cup or something, you know, at some point this cup will break, at some point, you know, this microphone will stop working, at some point um, this camera in front uh, might disappear, we had our previous camera stolen, so, you know, <laughs> so you got death, you know, things part, so it says parting happens at the time of death, and in our confusion, we feel greed, longing, and this leads to troubling and misery, melancholy, and grief. So we feel unhappy, which is very natural, right? When, when people pass away or when we lose the objects that we love, we feel sorry, we feel sad. Tears flow, followed by wails and lamentation. We start complaining. And I think we probably know that mind. We kind of start whining to ourselves. Why, 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 am I, why is this happening to me? This is not fair. You know, my, I remember being a kid growing up and always complaining to my mom. That's not fair. My mom would say, you know, I say, I want to go out and do you know, X, Y, or Z. And she says, no, you can't do that. I says, my friend's going to do that. Why can't I do that? She says, uh, just because you can't. You know, I, I, I get to make the rules. I say, that's not fair. <laughs> she says, she just say, life's not fair. And I said, oh, okay, that's not. But actually, in Buddhism, life's actually very fair. <laughs> there's, no, there's nothing. This is actually what's just describing this process is that actually life is very fair. There's this mechanism that's actually going on in the background that we're not seeing that's propelling us into our lives and is propelling everybody in their lives and we basically create our entire existence. So Buddhism is actually a religion of very, very radical self-responsibility. We're responsible for our entire life and what happens to us. It's not easy to take because uh, most of the time, I mean, honestly, we're trying to find a scapegoat. You know, my parents did this to me, therefore I'm this way. You know, I have this cultural, I'm in this culture, and therefore I'm this way. Or, you know, such and such, I, I, I have this kind of, I think there's a lot of things like biological determinism, like because I have this body, I'm human, I have these instincts, so therefore I'm trapped in this kind of, kind of these very base instinctual desires, that's just who I am, and that's my existence. Which is say, actually, there's something deeper, if you actually go in deeper, and you'll find there's something that's much more liberating. But to get there, it actually takes a step of recognizing that we actually have this radical responsibility. And this responsibility doesn't come from just blind belief or faith. It comes from seeing that this process, which we just outlined, actually is occurring in your life. You know, we could say, actually, no, I don't really want to know. Close the book. I'm just going to live my life. Ignorance is bliss. Until, you know, the ignorance hits something that's actually painful. And you go, ouch, that really hurts. And then you go, maybe at that point you open the book and say, what did it say exactly was this process? How did I get to this situation? So that's, that's really what this is about, is basically how we can end our suffering, how we can end the problems that we get ourselves into. So then it says the next one is that the five sense organs know suffering. On the ground of the mind, this becomes worry. As worry and suffering increase, they turn into afflictions. In that way, a tree of suffering grows and increases, but in this process, there is no self, nor anything that belongs to self. There is no doer of deeds, neither is there a receiver of actions. So this, this particular text, maybe next week we'll go over it again because there's probably another four or five lectures that can be included in just the teaching of not self, that ultimately um, we have this delusion of there being the self that is has this narrative voice that's propelling us along in our life. I actually think this is very helpful for when I talked about to the young man I spoke about in the very beginning of the lecture, is that what I find Buddhism being very helpful is that it tells us, actually, none of those narrative voices are really who you are. You don't actually have to buy into any of those narrative voices. You might have a competing voice, which is your parents' voice. Then you have your voice that you get from school. Then you get one that's from the movies. You know, one that's from, you know, uh, your internal self ego, your kind of super ego telling you something. So we have all these voices in our minds and we say, well, who am I? I mean, that's a question. And we were supposed to, we were supposed to find who we are in this world. 
and especially here in the West, we often get this kind of pressure to say, find out who I really am and then live my life based on that. My passions, whatever. But go, but who really am I? So it's like, who really am I? Like, what, what can I follow in my mind? What I find useful in Buddhism is saying, actually, that's not where, you're, where you need to look. That's actually all this conditioned reality. So if you really want to look, look at this, reflect on your life through this process and see if you can free yourself from it. And then you'll really understand what life is really about because you'll free yourself from the confusions that you've layered over it. Naturally, very naturally, you'll just know. That's, that's, the, that's the kind of the spirit. And so, so I was just saying, we're not going to go into this particular teaching, but I'll say this actually for me it was a very liberating teaching because what I realized is I wasn't so pressured to kind of figure out who I really am in the way of how society defines it, but just relax and use a process of reflection and contemplation to awaken to how things really are. So I took the focus from trying to figure out who I am, which is always changing all the time. You know, I watch a movie and it changes. I meet, talk to somebody I like, it changes. My parents tell me something, it gives me some kind of pressure, it changes. You know, all of a sudden I realize that's all external. There's something else going on that I can, I can free myself from. So, um, so Jean Fosher also was, was going to share something just a little bit, he said about um, the, the 12 conditioned links. Because the 12 conditioned links actually have another approach. I gave one approach, which is a much more, you could say, existential approach, which is in your cycle, this particular moment and how you can see your, your process creating this process all the time. But this is also a teaching which teaches how the Buddhist cycle of rebirth occurs from life to life, how consciousness occurs from life to life. So I know for some people who are new to Buddhism, the teachings on rebirth is more difficult because it's not something we can verify in our actual existential moment because it's saying, well, we have to die to know what happens next. <laughs> so since we're not dead, you know, really what happens next? We really don't know. Um, but what I, what, again, what I liked about this particular approach is that Buddhism says, here is the mechanism for it. You don't have to believe it but this is, I'm just describing it to you. And, and so I will say, when the time comes that we're actually dying, maybe it might be useful to, to refer to it again. So what's actually going on? Now I'm about to die. I better figure out what's happening. Because so I think um, in society's approach, which is generally just to ignore it, or to say we really can't find an answer to it, isn't really a very uh, useful approach. Because what that does is actually it kind of blinds us. You know, we never really look into this question, which in some ways is a very important question. What really actually happens? So Buddha is actually saying, this is what actually happens. And if you really investigate it and go and look into it, see if this is what actually happens. That's what it's saying. That's what it's presenting as a hypothesis for you to investigate. So with that, Ching Forsher, you are Jiang Yisha Guan Yu, Nika Sar Ying Yuan Pa. So I'll be translating for Dharma Master Ching Fu. Uh, Amitabha, uh, what, you ma? You ha? Okay. 我是金佛,刚才金传师已经讲得很详细了,就是解释十二因缘,其实这个算一个很基本,而且对我们非常重要的。我们每一时刻每一秒钟都发生在我们身上这个是一个非常重要的学习课程尤其是对我们人生目前要怎样子我们会讲到要怎样子来一个自由解脱而且不再烦恼苦恼的事情So my name is Jing Fo, uh, Ami To Fo. I'm um, uh, Jing Chuan. Uh, already spoke in great depth about each of these twelve conditioned links, and so what I would like to say is that these are actually very, very important. They're very, very basic for um, in the Buddhist teachings because this is something we experience in every moment, in every second. This is something that's going on, and this is a very important lesson in life which is teaching us how to find a way out of suffering and affliction and problems. 
This is a way out. Uh, 我們也是會有壓力,因為你本來要演講就是一種壓力,像我坐在這裡盤腿腿痛,你就是馬上就感受,這個就是一種馬上可以應用到要怎樣子來解除這個。那我跟大家在呼吸一下,我們十二音演,
，然后爱取，这个是一个我们已经可以从啊、呃、开始有，呃开始有了解了解外界的接触的一个情况。像我们现在都是在用这个东西，我们随时都在碰到这个东西。这个我们是一个现身。就是我们这一生的最重要的一个时刻，要怎样子从这里来学习到后面？大家可以呀。So, so here is probably where the most important part is, is because this is where we're at now. So basically, we come out of our mother's womb, and so this number six is two, which is contact. We just translate contact here. So our six senses, which become fully developed, right? Our eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind, they become developed, and we're now born. And so it's little babies. You see, we want to touch things. Everything we want to touch, right? They're starting to touch things, and we start coming into contact with the world. And we have this seven, which is so, which means feeling or sensory input. So we start having this kind of sensations that we like or dislike. And then the seventh or the eighth is I, which is love, literally, or a craving, or this kind of lack feeling of lacking that you want something outside. And Chu is grasping. So this one right here, number nine, is grasping. You attach to it. You you want to hold on to it forever. And so this is the this is the most important part because this is where we are and what we're doing all the time: six, seven, eight, and nine. 然后啊，到十二就是十、十一、十二，这个就是我们这一生现在所做的一个啊种下的因，然后后面就会接到这个。有这个果，这个果会影响到下一生，哎，这个是就是我们十二因缘法的一个循环。那我想很重要的，我们要怎样子来突破，要怎样子来断的这个，这个是我们最重要要学习佛法的一个重点。So then you have ten, eleven, and twelve, and so this is the results of this. So we have this six, seven, eight, nine. Then we have basically. Ex, uh, a yo existence becoming, mm. and then we we get born, get old, and die, and then that cycles us into the next life. Yeah, we we repeat that whole process. We die and our, we go out, have ignorance, and then we go off into the next rebirth. So this is the process. So what's most important is what do we do to、uh, to stop this process? How can we free ourselves from this process? That's the most important part of cultivation, a spiritual practice. Ten, eleven, twelve. Ten here is yo. This one right here. If you want to learn Chinese, you can write character. Yo, and that's existence or becoming. So I'm trying to just you you take on the 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 the, the since you've grasped onto it, you're like identifying with it. You're now taking as part of, and then sun is your birth. You you come into existence. You're 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 you're、um, you you're born, and the last one is. Uh, 老死 old age and death.、Mm. So that's the process. This is 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 the process. Create our identities and are born and then we died, and that's what create our current life. Like I just said, this we this 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 from the sixth to the ninth, this is the most important. This is ah, you always have that. That I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I 呀，这个这个中间我们都是随时在发生，随时那个，尤尤其在像这个爱爱方面哈，尤其是我们我我深深的觉得这个爱是就是情啊，爱情这个，所以情重你就会变成来生的这个，我们读很多经典都是这样子讲，那那圣公上年就一直强调要。去断情去爱，这个是最重要的。那对于西方国家讲，这个爱跟我们佛法上的爱是不一样的。我们佛法上的爱是有智慧的爱，要有智慧，要有要能够
有产生。我想跟啊大家讲一个有智慧的一个爱的一个故事啊。这个 ，so this particular section and the contact, feeling, grasping, and no, contact, feeling, love, and grasping. Is where we really want to apply our energy, and the most difficult one here is is the the one called love. We see emotional attachment, this kind of emotional、uh, love that that gets involved, this kind of wanting this intimate kind of closeness of something, and that's、uh, very very difficult to let go of. It's really built into our system, and so in our in the various teachings of Buddhism, also the, the Master Hua. He would really emphasize that we need to really let go of that need for that kind of emotional、uh, love, but it's not easy to do. It's really not easy to do. But that's really, if we really want to get free, that's what we have to do. Buddhism teaches that we need to have a doesn't. It's tricky because here in the in the West, there is the word love is different than the love. You could say sometimes as Buddhism refers to it. So maybe you could say that Buddhism is. Advocating for a love based in wisdom, as it has love, but the love is based in wisdom. It's not based on this process, which is a conditioned love, of a kind of emotional, conditional process. Ah, I want to talk about a love, a wise love, a love story. It's about love. 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 他讲啊，有一个年轻人，从小的时候就出家了。出家一出家以后啊，三四年都没有回家，三四年没有回家。那当然，他他出家以后，三四年以后，他也修到方丈的地位。那这个三十三十年当中呢，他家里发生了变故，就是啊，火烧了。那父亲也死了，啊，兄弟也死了，那妈妈还活着，妈妈还活着，她变成她没有家，没有家以后，她就就走出走出去去跟人家乞讨，一方面乞讨，一方面要去，她想到她的这个儿子，因为她儿子已经出家了，她一定她想要找到她的这个儿子。So I'm give a story about you could say this kind of. Uh, emotional attachment. The difficulty is to break it, and also to, to look at some way of you could say a kind of a, a a love that's based in wisdom. And so there's a story in Buddhism. This was a story that's given by a, a Dharma master named Chan Gong, and he said that there's a story where a young boy became a monk. He he left his his family and and went off to the monastery and became a monk. And 30 years passed, and he never returned home. And he cultivated very vigorously, and he actually became an abbot of a monastery. So he was,、uh, you know, the abbot of a monastery. However, in this 30 years in his home, his、uh, the the family actually met a lot of disasters. The family's house burned down.、Um, the、uh, the father, his father died. And his brothers also died unexpected,、um, suddenly and, and early, and so all that was left was his mother by herself, and so she was very poor without a household, and so it was just begging, looking just to just to survive, living a very difficult existence, and so,、um, so she was then thinking, oh maybe I can find my son, she was really looking to find her son、uh, that left home before, so she would have this thought in her mind to to find her son. 呃，他大概也知道说，他儿子在哪一个，他以前也听过在哪一个啊、呃、庙寺里面，他就走进这个庙寺，然后那时候刚好下午，然后那个呃方丈和尚就出来看看，他刚好看到他妈妈在那里，他妈妈他一一看到的时候，他吓呆了，然后然后他。他马上就自己就讲说，啊，这个妈妈来了，这个啊、呃、是啊、呃、算母亲的一个情啊，这个而且是他已经是
一一个方丈，他他说他当时就忍住了，忍住了，他啊<咳>、呃，他就跑去跟他妈妈讲，他而且他跑去跟他妈妈讲的时候，他一直讲说：“我不能哭，我不能哭，我不能哭。”也、yeah, 因为这个哈，这个就是一个一个情的问题啊。他他假如说他一哭出来的话，他妈妈就会认认得到他，所以他没有去哭，没有哭，然后他就跟他妈妈，他没有跟他认他妈妈，他跟他妈妈讲说，呃，你要来这里做什么啊？然后他说我来找儿子啊。他说哦，你要找儿子。叫叫什么名字啊？就跟他讲的哦，他他你这个儿子啊，在几年前他已经死掉了，哎，他已经死掉了，而且你这个儿子他跟我是很好的朋友，是呃亲兄弟一样，就是呃一样，所以你来找他，你呃这样子我就把你啊、呃、照顾你，然后你啊、呃、就可以来我们。庙上住，因为他三十多年了，也一样的看不出来，因为他剃了头这样子都没有，就没有认出来，没有认出来，就把他妈妈就安排在在庙室里面。那好 ，This is a very emotional story. So, so his mother comes looking for her son, and Um, can't f- and knows kind of roughly what monastery he went to. So she goes to this monastery, and you remember this, the, her, her son is the abbot of this monastery, and so his uh, this, the son who's the abbot monk uh, actually sees his mom coming in, and he's a little bit shocked. So my my mom is here, and he's uh, actually kind of moved in his heart. You know, he sees her; she's in this kind of destitute situation, and um, but he thinks to himself, I can't. I can't, can't cry. I have to be, I have to kind of, um, not, 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 kind of give give in to my kind of emotional, emotional reaction, and um, and so he spoke to his mother, and he he uh, his his mother didn't recognize him because you know he's shaved head thirty years later, he, he didn't really look like her son in the past, and so. Um, she, So he asked her, "Why are you here? What, what brings you to the monastery?" And her reply was, "I'm looking for my son." He says, "Oh, so who, what's your son's name?" He says, "Well, she's such and such name. He's such and such person." And and so he said, "Well, um, your son actually passed away a number of years ago. He was a really good friend of mine, and、um, it's just like a fellow fellow brother.、Um, but if what you would like to do, if you would like to stay here in the monastery, you can." Um, definitely take care of you here in the monastery. Then his mother also said, "I'm sorry, I'm here. She said, 'It's okay. You're here. But you, ah, every day pray, it's okay. Every day pray one thousand years old. You stay here. Then we will give you because in the temple you can take care of you. Then you can stay here.'" 所以你你住在这里，然后你就这样子练习住在这里就可以了。一方面你就不用再去外面去了。所以这个啊，后来呢，他他妈妈就真的做了，每天就在房间里面念佛念佛，他念到五六万声啊，到最后有一一天呐、啊，他跑来呃找方丈说，呃，方丈和尚，呃，明天中午。啊、uh, ，我要跟啊、uh, 告假，跟方丈和尚告假，呃，那个阿弥陀佛要叫我去了。然后方丈说：“一听哇，那很好啊。”他就告诉所有的那个寺庙里的人，就准备明天一起去念佛。然后就真的当当天啊、呃，中午的时候就往生了。这个是一个啊、呃，关于像这个情爱的事情，而且他啊。呃处理的非常妥当，虽然是好像有点残忍，但是这个给母亲能够往生，这个是一个大孝。我想这个是非常重要，而且这个我想说念佛，呃，像
，我们年纪大的念佛就是最适当的。你只要专心念佛，而且而且你看，我们有有阿弥陀佛，所以我们可以念佛就断掉了这一些了，断掉这一些。你只要一句佛号，就断掉这一些什么畜生、爱取，这个就没有了。没有了以后呢，然后。<咳>然后你你就不会了，就不会有这个东西了。也、yeah, 这个这个是，所以为什么念佛在我们呃这个所有的道场都是要叫我们念佛啊、呃、晚上，所以这个是一个很好的一个修行方式。Yeah. Okay,、hey, so um, so he tells his the mom right? He tells her that his Uh, your your son's passed away. He's no longer here, but you can stay here in the monastery. But his mom's reply is, you know, I can't stay here. She's a little bit embarrassed.、Um, she doesn't want to be a burden on the monastery. He says, no problem. You just stay here, and what you should do is every day you should recite the Buddha's name. So that's one of the Buddhist practices: reciting the Buddha's names. We recite Namo Amitabha. So he says, just recite the Buddha's name. You know, that's your job, and the monastery will take care of you. And so she would recite the Buddha's name, you know, up to fifty, sixty thousand times a day. She'd really focus on reciting the Buddha's name, and and make that her practice. Over three, it took about three years. This this process took about three years. And so then one day she went to meet the abbot of the monastery, her son. She went to see her, but she didn't know her son. She went to visit the abbot, saying, "Tomorrow afternoon I must take a leave of the the abbot." And the abbot said,、oh, "Why is that?" He says because I already got a message from Amitabha Buddha that I'm going to be leaving tomorrow at 12 p.m. at noon time. He says, "Oh, that's very good." And so he then arranged everybody in the monastery、uh, to go together at 12, 12 p.m. to recite the Buddha's name with her, and she just left for rebirth. And so this is one of those stories that you can see is very difficult to really put down this kind of emotional love, this kind of attachment to this kind of. Connection,、um, but what he, although it could seem in one level a kind of cold and unfeeling, but in fact it's really、uh, he was really、uh, teaching her and helping her and doing something that's a really you could say a, a greater filial act, a really、um, helping her in a more ultimate way, and so that she really was able to、uh, recite the Buddha's name and then、um, really go off to rebirth. And so, reciting Amitabha Buddha's name is a really a good method to put down all these、uh, contact, feeling,、uh, love, and grasping. You recite the Buddha's name, and then by doing that, you're able to also then put an end to ten, eleven, and twelve. You no longer get、uh, come into existence, get reborn, and go through old age, sickness, and death. So that's that's really an effective method. And that's why, particularly us who are elder in years. Is a very useful method to do to to cultivate, and why in the monasteries in the evenings we recite the Buddha's name, it's really、uh, really valuable, really important. Can I say one more sentence? Can I say one more sentence? Can I say one more sentence? Yeah, okay. So I was saying I could add a couple of comments on the story just to give a little bit of context. So、um, I think it's、uh, as I see, Jing Fu Shen and myself come from very different generations and very different backgrounds. And、um, so I'll say from that particular story、uh, is interesting、um, because growing up in the West, I would say we actually have a fairly different experience with parents than、uh, kids in the East or grow up in Asian countries, where they actually have a very strong tie to their parents in a very, uh, uh, very close way that's somewhat positive and and kind of like. The, it's almost like one unit, almost. Whereas here in the West, we're kind of like, "What my my mom wants me to do this? That, I don't want to do that." <laughs> Have I called my mom the last couple of months?、Uh, I don't know if I really talked to my mom.、Ever. It's like it doesn't really in the West. We don't really have that process. So I want to just give some context that my experience in、um, Buddhism, in fact, has been that oftentimes teachers have emphasized for those growing up in a more Western culture to actually be. Be more caring towards their parents and more thoughtful towards their parents, 
Whereas for the Asian disciples, oftentimes he was telling more, don't be so attached to your parents that you're, you're living your entire existence for your parents. So just give a little bit of context. But I think you can, if you listen to the story and you understand the principle, that's the important point, is that ultimately uh, we're cultivating a compassion and care for all beings that's not based on a kind of emotional relationship. And how can we free ourselves from that? I think we can all find maybe where we are most tied up and we're most kind of confused and see if we can uh, free ourselves from that. That's probably what, what's, if we can take away from this, this particular talk, that kind of principle and see and try to apply it, I think you've gained a lot. Yeah. Any other comments or questions? Um, actually, there's going to be a, a retreat happening um, this week, upcoming week at the City of the Thousand Buddhas. So Jing Foshir and myself and Mark will all be going up tomorrow, uh, or actually tonight, right after this lecture, we're going to be going up. And, um, and so we'll be there for a week, um, and we'll be back uh, next week. And um, Reverend Hong Shur is away, seeing his mom. His mom actually just passed away, so he's in this process of, you know, the process going back, and going in the cycle. And uh, but he'll be back probably Wednesday evening. So, um, any announcements that people have? We're uh, we've been announcing that we're going to have a Amitabha recitation session. Uh, Chief Forger just mentioned the particular Dharma door of Amitabha Buddha recitation, and we're going to do it for three days, um, right after Thanksgiving. So the Thanksgiving weekend, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, we we'll have a three-day recitation session. So if you're interested, please let us know. We were going to put a, a, a link online for people to to uh, sign up, but we quite haven't quite done that yet. So if you're interested, we did have a sign-up sheet that we were passing around at lunchtime today so people can sign up. It's for three days, and um, it's a really good chance for you to, uh, if you want to focus your mind by reciting the Buddha's name, it's definitely a really effective method. Not so much known in the West yet, but in Asia, it's by far the most popular practice. All three days, yeah. It's going to be from 8 a.m. for Friday and Saturday to 9 p.m., so it's like a full day. We'll have... People don't stay. Uh, we're not going to live here, but, um, but pretty much the entire day would be here. And, and I think if you really want to do the session, just go home to sleep and then come back and recite because it, it takes a little bit of time for the mind to... Like, for instance, you want to see this process, you actually have to let the mind relax and rest and not get caught up in all the distractions. So it takes usually about two, three days just for the mind to get clear enough to start seeing the underlying things that are happening. So it's a really valuable time to practice like that. So, yeah, it's, it's important because at some point we're going to have to open up our mind and take a look. And it's better to do it now rather than when we're dying. <laughs> yeah. Um, the process is going to be sitting and walking, maybe 30 minutes, 30 minutes. We haven't really, we haven't really kind of fixed the schedule yet, but the idea is going to be walking and sitting, kind of alternating in recitation. Most of like the city TV style. Yeah, most of the, city, the style we have in the city. The method, you, you cannot say city TV or, or, or not the method because we belong to Sufu, right? Then you just say, if you said to recite the, 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 the sutra, uh, Yeah, so we're in one, we're in one, I think the spirit of it is we're in one dharma, and so especially here, which is very much an ecumenical kind of tradition, we want to be very broad-minded, so we have various practices. So I think what you're referring to is that we're going to use two different methods of practice, of focusing the mind. So one method is what we are usually doing in our recitation in the monasteries, not we recite, people know the tune. Another method is a kind of a slower recitation that people walk around in. And so that's, there's two different methods that we use. So similarly, like in the monastery, we, we have Chan practice, Zen practice, and we also have Pure Land practice. 
we even have other religious groups come and, and teach. But, you know, if, so. if you, you belong to one, uh, one circle already, right, circle already enlightenment, then another one, you don't know who that monk, right? And you know, why you follow that, that monk? Uh, I think this would be a different discussion we could have later if you really want to, but my feeling is, um, well, I think a principle we want to have, especially if the master gave us, we really want to be, you could say, open-minded and not, not creating these kind of distinctions of self and other. We want to be one community. But we can talk about it afterwards. Yeah. We have a question? Yeah, it's more about the message. Is that the message? The, like the message that you have today? Okay, please, yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. Things. I was curious if there was something that's uh, is something you could repeat to help you be a more compassionate person. Um, that yeah. So what you the question is what can you repeat to be a more compassionate person? Um, I would say in our particular tradition, what we do a lot is recite Gwen in Bodhisattva's name. She's actually the Bodhisattva of great compassion. So she's kind of like the archetype of compassion. Her she has we have an altar in the back that's dedicated to her. So if you're interested, um, basically, actually this upcoming week is a Guanyin recitation week. So we do it three times a year at our main temple. And so if you have a chance, you can go up to visit, or um, we recite her name um, pretty often. It's it's a very easy practice, and that's the way. That's the, and there is a power to repetition, um, because it it basically um, sets the mind up to to kind of see things a certain way, so as a kind of a tool. So that's one way to recite the Buddha. Recite Guanyin Bodhisattva's name. The name is uh, how we tr- how we recite tr- is na mo, which means homage to guan uh, shi ying pu sa. So we say we actually have a tune that goes na mo guan shi ying pu sa hai na mo guan shi ying pu sa hai na. So we kind of. We have a we have the recitation of that if you want to get a get a kind of tape or a, a CD of it, but basically you can just recite Namo Guanshin Busa Namo Guanshin Busa in the mind, or you can chant it with a tune out loud. It's up to you, but I'll say a lot of people in our community just do that in their mind all the time, and they're just walking around, you're know, waiting in line, driving the car, and it's really helpful. You won't get angry, no road rage, you know. Namo Guanshin Busa Namo Guanshin. Okay. Yeah. Okay, um, so Guan Shi Ying. So Namo actually is a Sanskrit word for uh, Namaste. People know the word Namaste. So Namo is Namaste. And, uh, and then Guan Shi Ying. Guan literally means contemplate, to, to, ref- to, to, uh, to pay attention to. Guan, to, to observe. Shi is world, the world. And Ying is sound. So her, and then Pusa at the end is Bodhisattva. Is, so it's Guan Shi Ying Pusa, is the contemplator of the world sound bodhisattva. And so the principle is that basically she listens to the sounds of the world. And if you can really think about it, where does compassion come from? It comes from really careful listening. So she hears the kind of inner cries of all beings, of all people, of all beings, of all animals, all living beings. And so in the practice, when we were saying Guan Shi Bodhisattva's name, one is you can think of her as an actual being that we're connecting to this kind of compassionate energy. The other is also awakening this compassionate energy in ourselves. You know, there's that kind of internal, external, non-dual aspect. So that's the spirit. Okay. So what we do at the end of our lectures, we actually have a transference verse. And it's called the Dedication of Merit. You'll see it on the sheet in front of you, which has a Dharma request on it. Um, is there an extra sheet? Could you, could, oh, could you give one to Jing uh, Forsher? He needs one. So you'll see it's on the back of the sheet. It says dedication of merit. And so the spirit is that when we come and study, you know, the Buddha's teachings together, which are teachings on wisdom and compassion, um, there's a really a kind of sense of goodness behind it. 
you know, we didn't go outside and do something harmful, we didn't hurt anybody, so we did something good. And so the idea is that there's actually a goodness that's created that then we want to say, we want to share with other people. So if there's anything that you uh, want to share your goodness with, you know, if there's somebody who's sick that you care about, or a, a thing in the world that's a lot of suffering you see, people f in wars, um, and depressed, etc. If you send that merit to them, it definitely helps. It definitely helps. Although we don't see it with our physical eye, but I'm sure if we had our spiritual eyes open, we could see something happening. Um, how people are, are benefit from dedication and merit. So if you can put your palms together um, and see the verse. and wise may all become compassionate and wise so people would like we can stand up and bow to the Buddhas <laughs> 